In this lecture, we're going to discuss elastic collisions. And the elastic collisions are probably the, the most complicated um, type of collision that we'll be, we'll be dealing with, the basic uh, type on the elasticity spectrum. And that's primarily because I can give you the least amount of information and expect you to find the most out as a result. Um, and before we get into a specific example, now let's talk about some of the defining characteristics of the uh, elastic uh, collisions. So the first thing is that if we look at an elastic collision, we're of course dealing with momentum being conserved, and this is true for any collision type. But the defining characteristic of the elastic collision is that in addition to that, the kinetic energy, the linear or translational kinetic energy of the system is also conserved. Now this pretty much never happens in real life. Um, really what it comes down to is that in real life two things collide with each other and they generate heat. Now heat is, if you recall from your thermodynamics days, heat is really nothing more than the transfer of energy from a high temperature to a low temperature. And temperature is primarily associated with the motion of charged particles or particles in general. So if I have a really fast moving particle here and maybe another particle moving like so, what's going to happen is these two will almost collide with each other. When we get down to the atomic scale or the, if we're talking about atoms or electrons, that type of thing, what's really going on is that this would be perhaps um, a negatively charged electron and this is also a negatively charged electron and they get close to each other and they repel each other. Um, and this is true really for any particle, whether it's charged or not, you, they get close enough to each other and they'll repel each other. There's no actual contact. Nothing actually touches anything else. Um, there's just these elect electric uh, repulsions that will occur. And so they repel each other and they go off their merry little ways. And that's elastic. Um, but what happens at the macroscopic level, for instance with these two carts, is that energy is given over to the the motion of particles inside of each of these objects or to the motion of the particles outside of these objects. So they would be elastic if we could take into account the motion of every single little particle, um, but we rarely can do that. Um, so that's why this doesn't usually work out for us at a macroscopic level. We just can't keep track of everything. But what is nice is that this holds true for the two macroscopic objects. Um, so we'll be using this, and in this particular case of elastic collisions, we'll pretend like this is true. Um, one of the things that you, you've probably used elastic for is, let's say that I have a surface here, and we'll put a ball up here, maybe like a super ball, right? And you, you drop the ball, the ball drops down, and it bounces up maybe to here. So this is this is bounced up maybe 80% of the way to the original. And so we might call that 80% elastic. Maybe 80% of the energy is conserved within the, the system during this collision. Um, so that might be a Super Bowl. Uh, something like a diamond. If you bounced a diamond off of a diamond, you could get it to bounce up 90, probably between 95 and 99% of the original height which is very good. A billiard ball would also be in the 90s, uh, something that you, you'd use in pool, that type of a thing. So those things are all close to elastic, close enough that we might decide to fudge the, the situation by looking at it as if it were elastic. Uh, in this case, what we're going to do is try to get these two carts to be pretty elastic with each other. And if you've used the Vernier carts or the Pasco carts, you might have noticed some of them are magnet, magnetized. And so if we have two magnetized carts, what's going to happen is when they come towards each other, before they touch each other, they'll actually start repelling magnetically and bounce off of each other without ever making contact. Um, that's probably about as close as we can get to actually elastic at the macroscopic level. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some things to make this as easy as possible for us to solve. So the simplest case of an elastic collision is when it takes place within two dimensions, so they're going to move forward or backwards, and that's it. And I'm going to say that the mass of each of these objects is going to be equal to each other. 
And this will make it a lot easier actually um, to solve. It won't change the general um, type of problem that we're going to solve, but it will change the ease of the mechanics or the ease of the algebra. So, first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this because that was terrible. So the initial velocity for cart 2, I'm going to say it's negative 2 meters per second, and the initial velocity for cart 2, I'm going to say is 3 meters per second. And what I want to find from this is how fast both of these carts will be going after the collision occurs. I have a feeling that they're going to be bouncing off in opposite directions, but I'm going to leave it blank for now. I, I just don't know. With two unknowns, what that means is I need two equations, and it just so happens that I have those two equations already at my disposal. And I'm going to start with the conservation of momentum. My reason for starting with conservation uh, of momentum is that I'm going to lead into an equation now from conservation of momentum. I'll be substituting into an equation that has squares. Um, and I'm pretty good at squaring things. But I'm not so good at going from something that's squared to non-squared. In other words, dealing with square roots. Not my forte. Normally not my student's forte. So we're going to avoid that. And in this problem, even though they, they have the same masses, I'm going to write it in for now, just so you can see the setup. So I have my initial momentum of the system equaling to the final momentum of the system. And from here, we're going to do a little bit of simplification. So what I did was I crossed out the mass um, in each case, because the masses are the same. And I just moved v1 prime over to the other side through subtraction. I've grouped these two together. Uh, what I could do is I could substitute in the numbers, and I'd get out 1. So I'd have 1 minus v1 prime equals v2 prime. And I can certainly do that, but I'm not actually going to make use of it right now. I'm going to just do it the most general case. So I'm going to take this and ultimately plug it into a kinetic energy equation. So let's, let's get started on that kinetic energy equation. So we have T naught equals T final. The initial equals the final. And you have 1 half M1 V1 squared plus 1 half M2 V2 squared equals 1 half M1 V1 prime squared plus 1 half M2 V2 prime squared. Now this is a pretty irritating equation here. There's a lot going on. The nice thing is that we're going to be able to cancel things out and ultimately simplify and substitute items in. So what I did in this step was simply cross out all the masses and all the one halves to get to this point. And then it's a matter of substituting this equation in for v2 prime. So we'll end up with something that looks fairly complicated, but hopefully we'll be able to simplify it down as we continue to move forward. So I have v1 squared plus v2 squared, and these are just constants, equals v1 squared, I'm sorry, v1 prime squared, I haven't changed anything there. And then if I look at this, I really have one term and another term, and this is my variable term, this v1 prime. So I can square this first term, plus v1 plus v2, squared, and then we have um, minus 2v1 prime v1 plus v2 plus this times that again plus v1 prime squared. Uh, so when I do a little bit of rearranging, once again, uh, hopefully we'll see the results soon. So here I just continued my kind of simplification process, although it might look a little bit messier. And all I did was I took this term and I uh, factored it. I expanded it out. So I ended up with um, v1 squared plus um, 2v1 v2 plus, and this should actually just be 1 v2 squared. Okay? And that's just from this inner term here. And the other terms stay the same. So uh, what I did was I just recognized this as v1 prime squared twice, so 2v1 prime squared. And this one stays the same. There's nothing really interesting going on there. 
Now, one of the nice things about this, though, is that I can look at this and I can see I've got a V1 squared on each side. I have a V2 squared on each side. Okay? And so now I'm going to get a little bit of a simplification as well because I have a 2 in every term. So the 2 can go away. And that leaves me with 0 equals v1 prime squared minus v1 prime, I should say, times the quantity of v1 plus v2 plus, and then it gets a little bit messy, not too much, just right here, plus v1 prime, actually, hold on a second, plus 2, nope, canceled out the 2 already, v1, v2. So I, I did a lot of steps, actually, in, in 1 there. I canceled out the 2s in each term, and then I have v1 prime squared plus um, v1 prime times v1 plus v2 uh, plus v1, v2. Um, so that's ultimately what I wind up with. And at this point, I should be able to go through and solve. And there's some interesting results, and I'm going to uh, take a moment to show them to you, even though the video is getting a little bit long. Okay, so I'm just continuing up here from down here. I rewrote that last line. It was a little bit messy. So I have 0 equals v1 prime squared minus v1 prime times the quantity of v1 plus v2 plus v1 times v2. And when I plug in numbers, I get 1 as the coefficient, actually negative 1, because I still have that negative sign that I have to carry through. But this will just be 1, in this case, 3 minus 2. And then I have uh, plus 3 times negative 2, or negative 6, right here. And this actually works out very nicely, these numbers, and I can FOIL it. And then I can solve for v1 prime. And v1 prime is equal to either 3 meters per second or negative 2 meters per second. And both of these have meaning. Uh, for an elastic collision, where 100% of the energy is conserved, if the masses are the same, then the velocity simply transfers. So we started off with v2 going at 3 meters per second. Because v1 has the exact same mass, it's going to be moving at 3 meters per second after the collision in the same direction that v1 was moving in. Or I'm sorry, v2 was moving in. So we get a complete transfer of energy that, that occurs, as well as a, a transfer of momentum. And the other number indicates that the velocity of uh, cart 1 stays exactly the same. And that might seem pretty strange, except the mathematical equations have no idea that we're trying to look at collisions. So what it does, really what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I know the momentum of the system is conserved, and I know the translational kinetic energy is conserved. This leads to one of two answers. Either the collision happens, or the collision doesn't happen. Okay, this is no collision. What that would look like here is that you've got two pass carts, or Pasco carts, or veneer carts, and they're on tracks, but the two tracks are parallel to each other, separate from each other. So the two carts are going towards each other, but they never collide. That's what this, or this, that's what this solution represents. If we plug it in down here, um, if we plug the first one in, we'd have 1 minus 3, giving us negative 2 meters per second as the final velocity of the second cart, this one right here. So once again, we have an indication of a complete transfer of um, speed. That's only true because the masses are the same. If we had different masses, we would have a complete transfer of momentum, not just a complete transfer of speed. Um, and if we use probably the, the other number, um, which would indicate that the collision never actually occurred, then what we would get out of that is if the collision never actually occurred, we would have a, um, a 1 minus a negative 2 equaling v2 prime. And so we would wind up with then, uh, this would just be negative, negative 2 or 3. So we would wind up that um, if no collision actually occurred, v2 after the collision, v2 prime, would just continue to go in the same direction. Um, that's the basics, 
And I think I'm going to end it right now.